like to thank all my co-authors. Uh, as Barbara said, I was able to earn a lot of uh, awards. I published a good number of papers, but I was able to do this because I have a huge collaboration network. Uh, many, many very good students that are the core, I think, in, uh, uh, in doing the research. And collaboration network here, I think, is one of the most important uh, thing when you are doing actually this work. So many, many thanks to my co-authors because today I'm here also presenting the, the, the work that I carried out with them. Okay, before starting, let me do a, a preface. When uh, Gabriele and Barbara invited me to this summer school, they asked me to give a tutorial on empirical software engineering. Well, this was my first reaction. Uh, because actually they were invited me to do a tutorial to a summer school where there are a lot of PhD students, so this means that probably I'm not so young um, anymore. Well, uh, fortunately I stay in this status for a few seconds and then I said, okay, I can do a tutorial on empirical software engineering and then specifically I can talk about uh, on how to evaluate a method or a tool. Uh, sorry, Max, but I will not discuss about statistics, <laughs> even if statistics is really important for doing a clinical study, but I'm a computer scientist, I'm a scientist, I'm a, not a statistician, so I will focus on the design of the empirical studies. And specifically, I will show you concrete examples. I think what is really important for a professor is to give to students concrete examples because you can find uh, theories and examples too in textbook. But what you will not find in a textbook are the errors that you can make when you approach a new issue. And specifically, I want to share with you today my errors, my mistakes. And specifically, uh, because I think that mistakes are stepping stones to learning. So, learning by doing uh, is very, very important, but also learning from mistakes is very, very important. Specifically, today I will tell you a story. A story of my life, in reality of my academic life, uh, in the sense that I will show you my relationship with the, this new issue in the empirical software engine. I organize the story in four different chapters. The first one, I will talk you how it all began. So how I approached this new discipline that the empirical software engineering. Then I will discuss with you the law and date relationship that I have with this discipline. And specifically I will discuss the period of the crisis. When I started to hate the empirical software engineering. Then, I discuss with you the age of maturity when I realize how to use empirical methods in, uh, in doing research and so the age of serenity, apparently serenity, that is the, actually the age of uh, these days. And then I will finish my talk giving you some messages in the bottom. You are students, you are starting your PhD and I would like to give some advice on uh, how to not perform the same error and the same mistake that actually I did. I'm so happy that uh, this uh, lecture will be recorded so everyone will know my mistakes <laughs> <laughs> in uh, doing research and the, in doing the empirical studies. Not everyone, only people in the school. And they were the ones that also asked for the video, so we can extend it a bit. Please tell us everything. <laughs> so, let's start. I started my PhD in 2004. I was younger then. And my advisor, Andrea De Lucia, yes, in this picture, Andrea is not a good shape, but <laughs> this is Andrea De Lucia, said to me, Rocco, you have to learn statistics because we need to validate method and tools. In other words, he was asking me to learn how to evaluate a new methodology, a new method, a new tool. Of course, I was a student, I was young. My advisor was saying me that I had to learn something, and I said, okay, thanks for the advice. 
But in reality, I was a PhD student, I was doing my PhD in uh, software maintenance, so statistics for me is something that uh, is related to math. And uh, I don't want to write formulas, I don't want to play with numbers, I want to play with code. In other words, I wanted to improve the life of programmers without destroying my life. <laughs> and in reality, I was thinking that, uh, well, statistics, probably Miriam and Lynn are more than enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> so the message was rejected. And it was rejected also because I started my PhD working on uh, IR based traceability link recovery. What is IR based traceability link recovery? Just a parenthesis, in this tutorial I will not focus on the description of method but on the empirical, on the empirical studies that we conducted in order to evaluate the method. IR based traceability recovery, well, traceability information are relationships that exist between artifacts and uh, traceability information are useful for impact analysis, requirement coverage, and so on. Uh, but very often this uh, information are not stored during the software uh, evolution, and if they are stored, they are not up to date due to the evolution of the system. So you need uh, a method to recover this information. And one of the most uh, uh, important uh, approaches for recovering traceability information is uh, based on information retrieval. The idea is very simple. You have two artifacts, two set of artifacts. You need to recover traceability information between them. You can compute using information retrieval methods the similarity between these two groups of artifacts. And the conjecture is that the eigen is the similarity, the eigen is the likelihood that between these two artifacts there is a link. <coughs> of course, this is a semi automatic approach. As you can see here, there is a software engineer that navigates the list of candidate links provided by the approach and select this is correct, this is not correct. How to evaluate this tool? Well, since this tool is based, uh, is semi automatic, this means that there are some links here that are correct and some links that are false positive. So, a simple way to evaluate an IR based as a bit recovery tool is through precision memory code. And specifically, you can compute the precision memory code graph. The argument record, the argument precision, the argument is the accuracy of your tool. Well, this is the statistic that I need precision and recall. I published some papers on IR based traceability recovery, but in 2005 we had an idea, and specifically we had an idea to use differently information retrieval techniques and traceability links. Specifically, we had the idea to use traceability information and information retrieval to improve the source code vocabulary. The source code vocabulary is, is represented by the identifiers that you select when you write your code. So the name of the variables, for instance. Suppose that you have traceability information between uh, high-level artifacts, for instance, use case, and uh, source code. So you know uh, you are writing a class because you are implementing a new requirements, and your requirements is described by use case. Uh, if your code is probably written, if your code has a good vocabulary, uh, the terms that you use in your source code uh, as uh, variable names, as constant names, are not the names of method and so on, should also be present in the documentation. In other words, if I uh, uh, I'm implementing a new requirement, for instance, insert a new student, probably my class is called a student, and then we find some variables that are names, some name, address, and so on. And these terms are probably also in the documentation. So our idea is to provide um, the level of similarity between the code that you are developing and the related high-level similarity. Uh, High-level uh, artifact, sorry between your code and your use case in the example. This means that the higher the similarity between these two artifacts, so between your code and the use case, the higher is the quality of your vocabulary. We implemented the tool that we call it Coconut, that is an Eclipse plugin that you can see here. I'm developing this class. This is the list of uh, documentation artifacts. What can I do with Coconut? I can select the related high-level artifacts, so these are the requirements, use case, and so on. And the plugin shows me the textual similarity. 
Looking at this text on similarity, I have a feedback on the consistency between the terms that I'm using in the source code and the terms in the documentation. In addition, Coconut is also able, extracting terms from the documentation, is also able to suggest you identifier's name. Okay, you can see here that I'm, I'm writing here a class, I start in, uh, writing con, and Coconut suggests me contacts, contact information, uh, address contact, and so on. Okay, this is our tool. The problem is, uh, this is, this is the goal of our tool. Uh, the goal is to uh, improve the maintainability of the source code in, uh, in terms of vocabulary. So I want to improve the vocabulary, the quality of the vocabulary, in order to improve the maintainability of the code. Of the code. How to show me the textual similarity between source code and high level artifacts. Okay, which is our conjecture that having the tool available, the developer is able to improve the quality of the vocabulary, the source code vocabulary. As you can see, this conjecture cannot be evaluated by just using precision and rigor, as I did with the, the previous uh, approach. So we need a way to evaluate the tool. Well, in 2005, I also attended my first conference that was CSMR, that was the European Conference on Software Maintenance and Engineering. And during this conference, uh, my first was, was actually this was my first talk, and uh, the session chair was Miguel Alanza. <laughs> it is a very good <laughs> chain you know, of the session for this. this is, if for you, it's the first uh, conference. If you know Miguel Lanza, I can understand. Uh, <laughs> but also in 2005, I also met another guy that I consider, and not only Rafael Vito considered this guy, a guru of the empirical software engineering. So I explained to this guy the problem that I had. I had to evaluate Coconut. Coconut is a tool that is able to show the similarity between high level artifact and source code. And the idea is that if you use Coconut, you are able to improve the source code vocabulary quality. Well, this guy said to me, don't worry, what you need is not precision and recall, but you need to learn something about empirical software engineering. And I can help you. Wow, empirical software engineering. But what's that? Well, empirical software engineering is a part of software engineering that focus on experiment involving software system. So, if you have a new methodology, if you have a new method, if you have a new tool, you need an experiment, probably, in order to validate its benefits. I say that you need an experiment, probably, because another way to demonstrate the benefits of a new methodology or a tool is also uh, doing a formal proof. But since we are in the software maintenance community, it's quite difficult to formally evaluate a method. It's not impossible, but this is, is difficult. So you need to uh, run your tool, your experiment on the field, get information, get data from the field in order to evaluate its benefits. So the purpose of the, this experiment is to collect the data that can be used to validate theories. You have a conjecture, you have a theory, and you can validate empirically your theory. Why, so, why empirical software engineering is important? Of course it's important for researchers and more is important for me because I need, to, I need to validate coconut. I need to write another paper. And important for researchers because they want to evaluate new research results against something existing. So you need to evaluate your new method against the baseline. So you need to prove that your new your method is better than the state of the art. But it's also useful for practitioner because if you have to convince your manager that using NetBeans is better than using NetBeans, you need to for, you prove that actually your conjecture is correct. In other words, you need to collect data and show to your manager that the productivity, for instance, of your developer improved when you use NetBeans instead of Eclipse or Eclipse instead of NetBeans. So, empirical software engineering is not only useful for researchers, but it's also useful for practitioners. 
The guru suggested me also a book that actually inspired this presentation, and it's the book by Gulin et al. That is experimentation in software engineering. That has the final advice by saying in the foreword of this book, it's a well written and uh, it's, it's a wonderful book that cover a wide range of information necessary of performing experiments in software engineering. So this is a kind of bible for you. It's a kind of guidelines for uh, uh, doing empirical studies, empirical experiments in software engineering. I read this book. And actually, I started to uh, acquire some key concepts on the empirical strategies and all tests, experimental procedure, experimental design, you know, hypothesis, we concept test, experiment variable, treats to validity. Something that I completely ignore. But now I realize that this information, this, these things are really important, are really cool for my, for my research. And actually, it was a lot at first sight. So, uh, the relationship between me and the empirical software engineering is fantastic in this period. And it's fantastic because, with the help of the guru, we brought the paper and we presented the paper to the International Conference of Product Comprehension in 2006, and the paper, of course, was accepted. And these are some of the reviews and comments that the reviews give to us. This is a good experiment which can be used to evaluate the performance of information retrieval theory and techniques proposed by this researcher. So, good experiment. This is a solid, well written paper that is an exemplar of good experiment technique and scientific reporting in this field. Wow! Empirical software engineering is actually the solution that I needed the silver bullet. So, I started to write other papers. Following the same guidelines given by the guru, following the same guidelines given by, uh, in the book by Guru et al. And I wrote some papers, a good number of papers. Uh, some of them were related to the evaluation of uh, the traceability process used by developers when they use a traceability recovery tool. So instead of uh, evaluating the benefits of the tool, we are also evaluating how people use the tool and the benefits derived by different usage of the tool. But also, we perform some other empirical studies, for instance, to compare two different uh, design notations. For instance, uh, in our university, we use the, um, we use the entity relationship notation in the database cursive in order to do data modeling, and uh, the UML plus dynamic in software engineering. So we use two different notations to do the same thing. So we compare also these two different notations and now students use the different notation. But I realized that all this paper had almost the same structure. There is an introduction, there is an experiment design that is described using the template by Moon and et al. Um, a hypothesis, uh, experimental variable, experimental design, it's to validity, blah blah blah, experimental results. Almost the same structure. And uh, I realized that uh, my papers were becoming boring. Not papers, but they seem to be, seems to be a technical report, where there is no a story, where there is no a idea, but just an experiment. This was actually the start of a crisis. I started to hate empirical software engineering because actually this discipline focus uh, moved the focus from the method to the experiment. Too much numbers in my paper, too much test. And the crisis arrived. And the crisis arrived in 2009. I was a visiting researcher at the Ecole Polytechnique Memorial. I was working in the Julio Antonio group. And uh, with Julio we had an idea. There are a lot of papers that talk about program comprehension and uh, analyze the relationship between the quality of the identifiers and the comprehension of effort for the developers. They actually demonstrate or 
giving an indication that if the quality of the identifier is bad, the developer needs to spend much effort in order to comprehend the goal. Our goal in 2009 was to identify identifiers with poor quality. So our idea is to identify not meaningful identifiers in order to see their relationship with a specific aspect of the source code, that is the presence of defect. The conjecture is, if you in your code use bad identifier, there is the risk of introducing a defect is high, because you need to comprehend your code, and if you, your code is not, is not easy to comprehend, there is the risk to introduce a defect. In order to evaluate this project, we need something to identify identifiers with uh, low quality. And we define two new measures, that is the time entropy and the context coverage. The conjecture is that an identifier could be uh, poorly chosen or could be risky if you use the same identifier okay, in different contexts in different source code entities, thus with different meaning. Okay? For instance, uh, you can uh, uh, fit to the, the, the term path. If I use path in one code, in one source code, in one class, and path in another class, I'm using path in two different contexts, in two different classes. But in the first class, I was referring to a relative path. In the second class, I was referring with the same identifier path to an absolute part. This could be misleading for the developer that is reading the two source code classes. This two measure, that is term entropy, measure actually the physical and conceptual dispersion of the identifier. Uh, you can find it in the paper, but just to give you an idea on how this measure works. Uh, Let's see this example. You can see here there are three different identifiers. One of these is phi. As you can see, phi occurs almost in all the entities with almost the same number of occurrences. Okay? The sides of the circle represent the number of occurrences. Phu, instead, occurs in three different entities. But as you can see, uh, the main entities for phu is E2. Instead, for phi is different to is difficult to identify which is the main entity, which is the most important entity for phi, because the number of occurrences are almost the same. This means that the entropy for phi is higher than the entropy of phi. This is the physical dispersion. The conceptual dispersion is based once again on information retrieval method, and specifically, the idea is to cluster together similar classes based, of course on the source code vocabulary. So we have here uh, four different clusters. Cluster means that we group together classes that talk about the same thing, that share a lot of instance variables, for instance, or a number of terms in two classes. And we can measure the conceptual dispersion, or, in other words, in how many clusters the identifier occurs. Of course, if you have an identifier that occurs in almost all the cluster, this means that you are using the same identifier in different contexts. If you put together these two metrics, that is term entropy and context coverage, you are interested in identifying uh, variables or identifiers that has, have a high term entropy and an high uh, context coverage because these identifiers are used a lot because the entropy is high in different contexts. These are for us poorly chosen identifiers. Next step is to identify and to verify if the presence of poorly chosen identifier is in some way correlated with the presence of defect. So we build uh, a predictive model where we used uh, the term entropy and the context coverage in order to predict the presence of defect. And what we observe? Well, we observe that 
first of all, our measure do not correlate with log lines of code, so they capture different thing. Good. As you can see, probably lines of code is one of the best predictor for defect. So we capture something different from the lines of code. And there is a statistical significant correlation between the presence of defect and the tube measure. So the results show us that there is a, a correlation between poorly chosen identifier and the presence of defect. Bingo. We have a paper, we have a nice paper, so we submit the paper to the Early Research Achievement Track of uh, ICSM 2010, and these are some of the comments that we received. This is an excellent paper, superbly written, with many selling points. Once again, we follow the template by Moulin et al. The problem is interesting and important, and the result is convincing. Wow. The paper was accepted. We got also another nice comment that is an example of error proof identified should be reported. Wow, this is a good uh, this is a good comment. Uh, we did not focus on this example in the paper because of the space limitation. This is an inner paper, so just for pages we focus, uh, of course, uh, on the numbers, on the empirical study, blah 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 blah. But this is, could be an interesting. Uh, selling point for a future extension of the paper. This paper got the best paper award at the ICSM 2010. Good. Now let's work on the, on the extension of this work and starting from uh, the last comment by the reviewer. So let's search for an error prone identifier. Just an example. We analyze Mozilla Rhino 